This is David Bernstein. Welcome to this edition of The Speechcast, a joint venture between the newly created Jewish Institute for Liberal Values and the Jewish Journal's The Speech Project. We're interviewing very interesting people, and uh, one of the people I've been most excited to talk to because he's sort of a uh, intellectual hero of mine um, is uh, Professor Jonathan Sarna. Uh, professor Sarna is the university professor of Brandeis. He is the uh, Joseph and H. and Bella R. Braun Professor of American Jewish History at Brandeis. And he is he heads up the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies. Um, he is uh, perhaps one of the, if not the most preeminent Jewish historian of our time, and particularly of American Jewish history. And he's the person that many of us have turned to over the years to get sort of that larger perspective of what's going on in our own community. And so, so glad, uh, Professor Sonner, you could join us today. Delighted to be with you. Thanks. So um, I know that you have concerns because we've talked about them, about the current ideological moment and how it might affect the academy. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, sure. Um, I think for a long time, uh, Jewish studies as a field uh, saw itself as committed to scholarly objectivity. The earlier generation used to speak of the science of Judaism. Wissenschaft des Judentums in German. Now, they didn't literally uh, uh, think that there was a, a, a science uh, like chemistry, but what they meant was that it was scientific in the sense that you used evidence, it was value free. If new evidence arose, that would change the way you thought about it, you kind of followed the scholarship. Politics was in a totally different realm. Now, uh, for a long time, uh, uh, we've learned from sociology of knowledge that nobody is totally value free. But that's like saying uh, there's no place with liberty and justice for all, or nobody truly reaches perfection. The point is you strive for it. And Jewish studies strive for scholarly objectivity. It's and uh, for, you know, a scientific method. Um, I would say that more recently, younger scholars have said, look, uh, there's no such thing as objectivity. We're not so sure there's even such a thing as truth uh, in a postmodern setting. And as a result of that, they felt free to bring politics into the academy. Um, the personal is the political. The, um, uh, the very kinds of scholarship, some of them said that they did was political self, for example, a, a scholarship that added a great deal. Women's studies, which we all agree added new material, but some of those in the field went further and said, not only do we want to explain the role of women, but we have a political agenda and indeed, that began to shape what they studied. I, I well remember having a student, it was not a scholar, but I, a, young, a graduate student wanted to work in women's history. And I said, this will show you how many years ago it is, because since a book has come out, I said, you know, you should study 
the Rebetzins, the wife of rabbis, because they had a lot of power. They were, in many cases themselves, the daughters of rabbis. You should look at it. I never forgot what she said. Oh, I would never do that. Those are not our role models. Those are the people uh, we want to overcome. Mm -hmm. And that brought home to me how different uh, the world had become. Thank God, Professor, now uh, a Chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary, Shuli Rubin Schwartz, did a wonderful book showing how important they were. But more recently, I fear that we have seen uh, politics uh, enter the academy um, uh, in very serious ways so that um, uh, whole subjects are some, and whole scholars are somehow canceled. Uh, I don't like or it may be uh, misbehavior on their part, you're not allowed to cite their books. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, um, uh, uh, you're not allowed to learn uh, 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 from them. The mixing of scholarly agenda, which in my world, you seek truth wherever you find it. Sometimes the almighty uh, puts truth in the hands of people you don't like, but uh, uh, you learn from them. Um, uh, one of, uh, and today that has all uh, been questioned. Um, uh, and uh, indeed we had a, 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 you know it well, we had a recent uh, a case of two of the, the most apolitical, uh, scholars uh, dedicated to numbers, and they wrote a piece in which they observed that somebody else's study of the number of Jews of color in America didn't match what we knew from all existing studies. How do you explain that those numbers are so out of kilter? And of course, that was politically incorrect and all sorts of people came down on them because uh, uh, at that moment in time to suggest that there aren't as many Jews of color as uh, some optimistic uh, politically minded scholar uh, wanted there to be was somehow uh, uh, an attack on Jews of color instead uh, of what these people, uh, Felt Press Dushevskin and uh, 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 Press Dushevsky, they didn't know what hit them, that we've spent their mm -hmm. whole life devoted to truth. We did many studies, we're demographers, and they were attacked suddenly as racists and, uh, and the like. The amazing thing is a very, very expensive and extensive study just came out, the new Pew study, much more exacting than any previous study and shows that their numbers were absolutely on target. Uh, that the number that they gave, which was about 8% with more as you get younger, I was precisely right. The other study was ideological. They knew what they had to find before they found it. And, uh, and they uh, found it. You know, and it showed, and, and, and the whole episode, I think, demonstrates uh, the danger that, uh, uh, that, um, uh, has arisen uh, of, of scholarship being politicized and people writing their politics into um, what, what was once deemed science. 
uh, we see today people um, uh, undermining journals and scholars. Well, look who funds it. Um, well, um, maybe we should look what they say rather than who funds it. Sure, right. if the funder is demanding a certain line, okay. Um, but um, uh, the bottom line in scholarship has to be truth. Once we move from that, we don't believe there is truth. Uh, the bottom line ought to be uh, uh, advancing our political goals. And then it seems to me that the whole enterprise uh, is undermined. And I have to admit uh, that I am deeply worried about certain currents um, in the field that I think have weakened the field as a whole, just as bad science. <clears throat> science that doesn't scrupulously adhere to the truth inevitably uh, weakens a science. So many people were afraid that uh, 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 COVID and the battle against COVID would be undermined uh, because um, you weren't following the science. Uh, well, although in, in our case, it happens to come from the left and not from the right, the problem is identical. Uh, once uh, you don't have a commitment to finding the truth, and you don't have a commitment to scholarly objectivity, uh, then it seems to me, frankly, that all is lost. Mm. So I, I recently spoke off the record with a professor at one of the rabbinical colleges, um, a reform, reform uh, rabbi who's a professor, um, who told me that there, there's a lot of talk among other professors about sort of highly ideological students uh, who challenge every word they say, who, um, who are, who, you know, um, and, and, and they're finding it very difficult to just do what they do, which is teach. Um, and their students demand a, sometimes a monolithic perspective from their professors that they're not accustomed to. Do you find that in your students at all, or are you, do you see your students are open to different ideological or, or political or uh, scholarly perspectives? Um, I'm probably fortunate that I, I haven't found it. Remember, uh, thank God at Brandeis, we have all sorts of faculty and students and uh, uh, people can choose their courses. And I want to make uh, clear that I think, uh, um, and it's not accident, uh, Brandeis um, uh, has largely been committed to traditional canons of scholarship. But I've definitely heard um, uh, what, what you have heard. And, um, uh, you know, I, I know, um, uh, scholars, senior scholars who, you know, just decided to retire. I don't need this. This isn't uh, the scholarship uh, that I'm interested in uh, promoting. It's not scholarship at all. Um, I think rabbinical schools and professional schools are somewhat different in what they allow students to do than, um, uh, than undergraduate. Um, uh, but although I want to make clear, I'm obviously happy when students challenge. And I have no problem even with students who ask um, questions that clearly are drawn from our contemporary times. Um, uh, you know, I, I assume that the canons of scholarship 
are going to inform uh, my answers. And, uh, you know, sometimes they don't get the answer that they wish they had. And uh, that's because I don't uh, change history in order uh, to uh, uh, satisfy uh, their, um, uh, their goals. Uh, but I do agree with you. And I think, uh, frankly, the study of Israel is an area where we see this especially and has become a deeply politicized uh, arena. And it takes a very special uh, kind of a scholar uh, who, who knows how uh, to, to negotiate uh, those kinds of uh, issues. Um, whether it will spread to all areas, uh, you know, remains, uh, remains to be seen. I certainly hope not, uh, but I, I have to say that I was dismayed that the Association for Jewish Studies, which is our, our scholarly uh, body, I, I was once its president, uh, didn't come down much harder against those who sought to inject politics, political correctness, and so forth, cancel culture uh, into uh, the work of the AJS. To my mind, it should totally have been ruled out of order. Uh, and in fact, the president of the AJS uh, uh, you know, uh, resigned and uh, uh, in a sense uh, wrote a confession that kind of reminded some of us uh, of things we used to read in communist days um, uh, from people who wrote extended confessions and then they would throw them out the window. In right. this case, he wrote an extended confession and then they threw him out of the, the AJS presidency but it was very much the same mindset and a mindset that seemed to me to go against uh, the canons of objectivity, truth seeking, scholarship uh, that I have long uh, held dear. Can you give us some more detail about what particularly caused this rift within the Jewish Studies Association? Well, I should make clear that uh, I'm now, I think, an XXX uh, president, and there are enough Xs uh, that I no longer sit on the board. And I think it's, I did speak to people who do sit on the board and my knowledge, although uh, they spoke to me confidentially, is certainly informed by what some of them told me, but I was not there. I think uh, the deep issue is about uh, the place of politics and scholarship uh, and, and, and so on. I, I think also uh, even debates over Israel, there's a kind of one-to-one -one correspondence between the folks um, who uh, have uh, uh, sought to remove um, uh, the president and folks who you know, have dissenting views on Israel and, and other things. But nevertheless, the manifest issue, as I understand it, did have to do with the fact that the president of the AJS, who uh, uh, is in touch with uh, currents of contemporary Jewish life, um, I spoke with a group of very senior scholars, leading uh, senior scholars in the field. But among those scholars was Stephen M. Cohen, uh, who had been, um, uh, you know, who had misbehaved and uh, um, uh, uh, who had been punished for it, but uh, remains a, a 
towering scholar. And, um, uh, uh, you know, he thought that he was engaging in scholarly interactions um, and discussions. And the other side felt that interacting with this person, no matter how significant a scholar he was, was inappropriate. And, um, uh, you know, that the only punishment uh, was, um, was for him to resign, uh, which is really almost unthinkable. Uh, and I say that uh, in part because, um, you know, the HAS was always a place where um, uh, we had um, uh, people uh, who uh, were very orthodox people uh, uh, who uh, were not Jewish or were um, uh, anti-religious, and you never asked those questions. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, you had people who were pro-Zionist people uh, who didn't believe in Zionism. All that mattered was the scholarship itself, and you didn't ask uh, further questions. And what disturbed me so much uh, was uh, that uh, it, it seemed to me that uh, these actions had undermined uh, that ideal. And once that ideal is undermined, uh, it's very hard to rebuild. Uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, Orthodox will um, uh, go um, uh, and have their organization, the anti-Zionist theirs, and everybody will be in a silo and really what, what, what to me was so deeply precious that there was this magic space where we all put our politics aside, our religious views aside, and we simply talked about scholarly matters that that, that is so easy to lose. And, um, you know, when we stop listening to one another, stop interacting, uh, with one another, um, uh, and we say, no, uh, this person is wicked, uh, I have nothing to do with him, that's really the end of scholarly discourse, and to my mind, the implications are very dire. Hmm. Recently, um, an academic out of the UK named Eric Kaufman did a study about political attitudes in the academy. He looked at both he asked people who were left of center what they thought about right of center academics. He, he asked right of center academics and there were you know, a small number, 10% 10, 10 or so, what uh, they thought of uh, the attitudes of their uh, center left counterparts. And it revealed something that we probably already knew, which is that you know the academy tilts quite left and is not all that tolerant of people who are right of center that um, um, center right or even centrist academics felt that they had a, a, an uphill battle in the academy and tended to sort of do something else. Um, you know, they, they didn't stay uh, in the academy or if they, if they were lucky enough to be tenured, they sort of, you know, kept their politics out, but it was in an atmosphere that was highly politicized. Is that, is that what you see around you today? Yeah, um, it's a great irony. The the university, all today universities uh, talk the talk about, oh, we need diversity. And, uh, you know, no, they collect data, how many women, how many Asians, how many African Americans, and that diversity is important. But when you suggest, isn't the most important diversity intellectual diversity? Isn't it a bad thing that we have nobody who uh, comes from a more conservative uh, point of view? 
isn't it terrible that a student can go through a university and never meet anybody who uh, voted Republican, anybody who uh, uh, supports evangelical views, anyone who opposes abortion. They don't even understand the other, um, uh, uh, the, the other. Um, we talk about a polarized America and don't realize the extent to which universities, I'm sorry to say today, uh, promote uh, unwittingly, but promote that polarization because they do not expose students to the full range of ideas um, in America today. And, and intellectual diversity, which ought to be the most important aspect of diversity. Um, uh, I don't know even one uh, uh, office of diversity that either keeps records or asks questions about the intellectual diversity um, in, uh, in the university. And we suffer a great deal uh, uh, from that. Yeah. Do you see any light at the end of the tunnel? Oh, I, I'm a historian. You take the long view. Um, uh, I, I think all sorts of things uh, could change. Um, uh, I First of all, I happen to think that philanthropists can play a huge role in promoting that change. Remember, universities depend heavily on philanthropists. And although I think um, we do want the universities to be places of free inquiry, and we certainly want to encourage uh, a broad spectrum of views, uh, you know, it would certainly seem to me that philanthropists could do a great deal uh, to promote intellectual diversity within the university. And it seems to me that the case that we will be a stronger and better America if students in their college years are exposed to blue and red America, to representatives of both, to the different ideas, and they'll debate one another, that will be infinitely stronger and will do much more to bring us together ultimately uh, then um, uh, if we have uh, essentially uh, top universities where it's, as the study you quote shows, very hard to find a representative of, of red America. And uh, uh, if somebody votes for Donald Trump, they're likely to keep it totally for themselves. Uh, that, that can't be good. Um, and uh, um, uh, I think philanthropists could do a lot. I am worried, and I've heard from major philanthropists, even in the Jewish world, that you know they're withdrawing from the university. But that can't be the right answer because, uh, first of all, universities have in many ways been the secret of Jewish success. Uh, the fact that Jews are uh, the most highly educated um, uh, ethno-religious group in America helps to explain uh, what they have achieved. Um, and um, I can't imagine that we want an America where uh, Jews are uneducated because we don't like everything that they're taught at the university. But I definitely think uh, and can think of lots of ways that 
uh, philanthropists um, uh, could bring viewpoint diversity uh, into the university, insist upon it, celebrate it, measure it, and, uh, and fund it. Uh, and uh, over time, these changes won't happen overnight, but over time, that will absolutely make a difference. You, know, you talk about viewpoint diversity either with other faculty members or with students or administration. Does it come up as a topic of conversation? Look, uh, I'm professor of American Jewish history. That's what I'm paid to do. Um, and I would be quite hypocritical if I told others to keep their scholarship and their politics separate, and I didn't do so myself. Uh, I think uh, you know, there are people within the faculty, within my department, who, who certainly know how I feel. Um, but, you know, I am happy if my students <coughs> can't imagine uh, who I vote for, and I, I, I like it better that way. I remember the days when you didn't know what a journalist's view was. Uh, you knew what the New York Times editorial page view was, but fact and opinion were rigidly kept separate. Uh, and of course, that's totally changed. Um, uh, 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 the New York Times on its front page, through the articles, through its headlines, through its photographs, make perfectly clear what its views are. Uh, and we're seeing that, you know, in the university as well. I think it's a bad thing. And I think we were better off in a world where people at least strive uh, for objectivity and were committed to ideas of, uh, uh, of uh, ideals of science. Um, um, and then they had whatever views they had, but they were kept separate. Um, but, um, uh, you know, I did, um, I did once raise with a, uh, uh, head of an office of diversity at my university, you know, whether viewpoint diversity uh, was something that they measured and looked at. And the response was, no, we, we would never dream of asking somebody uh, what their uh, views are. Uh, we only focus on uh, the well-known uh, issues of uh, gender, race, and so forth. Hmm. One last question. Um, yesterday, I was part of a discussion with a professor, and I'm not sure if he wants to be public, so I won't mention his name. He's actually quite a left-wing guy, but um, he's very fearful about the state of liberalism in this country, and particularly at the university. And, um, and he was arguing for quite sort of illiberal politics as a counter to the direction of the university. And I, and I queried him on that. I said, look, um, you know, we're, we're standing up for liberalism, which means that we stand up for this free exchange of ideas. And that means keeping politics out, just as you said. Um, he said, that, that's what I used to believe. So I used to think I'm still liberal, but I don't think we can actually win back the liberal campus or liberalism society unless we start playing hardball and we play the game that they're playing. We can't, we can't defeat the, the other side's game with um, with you know liberalism alone, and it you know it's something I've struggled with myself as I think about what it's going to take to to turn the tide on this and restore a sense of sanity in our public conversation. What do you have to say about that point of view, though? Um, you know what Churchill said about capitalism: it's the worst system in the world, except for all the others. And that's probably true. And we should make clear that we're talking about liberalism with a small L. Yes. Um, with its assumptions um, 
I can't imagine a university where there were ideas uh, deemed heretical. And it seems to me um, as a historian that I can uh, think of all sorts of heretical ideas beginning with Zionism, one of the great heresies when it began or the day school movement, a, a great heresy uh, that uh, later uh, were widely accepted. So I'm a little nervous about moving away from uh, liberalism. Frankly, I would be happy to see traditional liberalism strengthened and restored. Cancel culture. Can't teach this person's books. Can't mention his name. Uh, that, to my mind, is a much more serious danger um, than, uh, than liberalism. Um, and I think that the idea, uh, which I said earlier, of promoting viewpoint diversity, uh, to some extent, uh, the idea of making sure that there are students with very diverse views and they should be asking questions. Why does nobody represent uh, these perspectives. Why don't we understand evangelicals? Why isn't it even being taught? Uh, that, I think, is much more likely uh, to be successful than trying to shut down voices with which I may personally um, uh, uh, disagree. But I do think that we have to be a lot stricter about truly expelling from the university folks who want to shut other folks down. Uh, mm. uh, the disruptions of the other side um, justified in all sorts of language uh, those people, uh, and, and it should be merciless. Uh, and and uh, some universities have indeed, I think the University of Chicago right. is one of them, uh, have students sign. Um, yes, you can ask tough questions, but you cannot disrupt either a class or a lecture. And if you do, you're out of here. Mm -hmm. And this is our commitment. And I think um that um uh, though that needs the that that is a model that more universities need to have uh, the courage to to adopt yes couldn't agree more the university of chicago sends out uh, through its students uh, dean of students every year all incoming freshmen receive this letter that uh you're not going to find an intellectual safe space here there's not going to be trigger warnings. We're here to talk about issues openly. Unfortunately, we don't see a lot of that. And even at University of Chicago, I'm sorry to say there's been some lapses as well. But um, this has been very um, informative and interesting. And I think your perspective is so important for people in the Jewish community. They've been listening to you talk about Jewish history in the long view. Since I remember, I can remember, I mean, I've been in the Jewish world my entire professional life, and you've always been um, part of it. You've always been one of those people that helps us interpret the world around us. And I hope they'll listen to what you have to say about the threats to liberalism inside and out of the academy. Well, Professor thank Sarna, you, thank you. And really so wonderful uh, to be with you today.